Um, next up, we have two engineers from Uber who have come to talk to us about Octopus taking on the Uber challenge. Um, I'd like to welcome Apple Chow and Bian Zhang from Uber to the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Apple, and I manage the mobile test infrastructure team at Uber. I'm very excited to be here today. So first, let me give you some information about myself. I am an ex-Googler. I was at Google for nine years, and I led the testing team on a wide array of projects, including YouTube, Hangouts, and Google Maps. At first, I thought I've seen it all in the world of automated testing. When I joined Uber in March, however, I found that the level of challenges we face at Uber is at a uniquely different level. I'm very excited to share with you some of the technologies we built from scratch to solve those challenges at Uber. And we are also planning to open source some of the solutions very soon. So I hope that you'll find something useful in our talk today, which you can apply to your projects. So what is it that makes testing Uber unique? Before I reveal the answer to my question, first, let's take a quick survey. How many of you have used Uber? Wow, that's a lot of you. That's great. And my next question. How many of you know that there's a separate driver app? I see, not that many of you. OK, now to my third question. How many of you have ever tried out to be an Uber driver? <laughs> well, there's lots of perks about being an Uber driver, but that's not uh, the point of today's talk. So, so after my previous hint, now can you guess the answer to my question? What makes testing Uber's mobile apps significantly different from, let's say, testing Google Maps? Anyone want to tell me the answer? Any guess? Two apps? Good, that's, that's great, yes. So what's our Uber challenge? The driver app and the rider app are tied together. So this is one of the first challenges we faced when we were investigating UI testing tools for automating the sanity test scenarios for the mobile org at Uber. We found that many of the scenarios require the rider app and the driver app interacting closely with one another in order to complete the scenario. So how do we solve this? And now let's first take a moment and think about our current and previous projects. Have you ever encountered a case where multiple users have to collaborate together in order to finish a scenario? And have you ever faced a scenario where you have users, your app has to talk with another app in order to finish a scenario? I can immediately think of a few cases where this applies. For example, at Hangouts, we have one-to-one -one or group conversations or video calls where multiple users have to collaborate together to finish those scenarios. Also, my friends at games. There are so many games that require multiple users participating together to finish a game. So basically anything that involves multiple users talking with one another in order to finish a scenario will face a similar challenge. So what's unique to Uber is that our core flow is consisted of many distinct steps that are happening not just across different devices, but across apps, the driver app and the rider app. So that makes it even more challenging. I think the more common case is that you have multiple devices interacting with one another, but still with the same app. So how do we solve it? Our solution is called Octopus. So even though our challenge is unique, our solution is a generic test runner that can be applied to run any scenarios that involving cross-device 
or cross app communication. So, ready to see Octopus in action? First, let's watch a quick demo showing the interactions between the driver and the rider for our core chip flow scenario, where the Uber driver is giving a rider a ride. Then, we will look beneath the surface and see what Octopus is doing. So in this demo, you'll see Octopus launching two Android emulators side by side, one running the driver app and one running the rider app. So let's play the video. So here you can see the rider and driver both sign in. The left side is the rider, the right side is the driver. So first, the rider sets the pickup location, and then the driver goes online and is ready to get requests. Now the rider on the left clicks on request UberX to request for UberX. Driver gets the dispatch, accepts it, and is en route to pick up rider. Driver then picks up rider, begins the trip. The rider on the left sees that he's now on trip. And driver arrives at destination, drops off rider, rates the rider, and then rider will rate the driver. So this is the sequence of our most basic trip flow scenario where the driver gives the ride to the rider. Now think of a more complicated scenario, like the Uber pool. I'm not sure how many of you have used Uber pool, in a Uber pool scenario, you have one driver and usually at least like two to three different parties of riders. So over there, you have three to four devices collaborating together in a scenario. So the synchronization gets even more complicated. So now, let's look at the scenario step by step. Remember in the previous demo, I showed that Octopus launched both the driver app and the rider app at the same time. And each of the driver tests and rider tests you know, goes in and execute their own sequence of steps. Now let's imagine what could go wrong there. Remember that th those two tests are running in two separate processes. I mean, even though it looks like it's all together in one scenario. So underneath the cover, it's running in two different processes. What if the rider logs in before the driver and requests for the ride? before the driver is ready to accept the ride. Then the request could time out, and then you wouldn't be testing the scenario that you want to test, right? So how does the rider know that driver is online and now I can send the request? So this is where Octopus comes in. So Octopus, we introduced this concept of signaling. So using signaling, Octopus can, the, the driver app, can tell the rider that, hey, I'm online now. Now you can request. Then the rider test can go ahead and request. So using signaling, Octopus allows you to set up different checkpoints along your test scenario to make sure the steps are executed in the right order so that you can still communicate with one another. So with Octopus help, so here's the correct sequence. So after they log in, first the driver goes online by clicking on go online. And then the request goes to the backend and the backend acknowledges it. Now, Octopus sends a signal from the driver test to the rider test and say, hey, I'm online now, now we can request. The rider test now clicks on request Uber X and the request goes to the backend and then the dispatch gets sent to the driver. So in a similar fashion, you, you can see that along the way, you can put in different checkpoints. For example, after that, maybe the driver can tell the rider, hey, I accepted the ride. Then the rider test can check the status bar on the top and say, okay, I can see the driver is in route to pick me up, things like that. So let's talk more about Octopus. So what were all the reasons behind why we built Octopus? First, we wanted a unified test runner for both our Android and iOS apps. 
Secondly, we want we wanted extensibility so that our, our runner can be integrated with different UI testing frameworks. Thirdly, we wanted to support parallelized runs so that we can speed up our tests. And lastly, as I showed in the previous demo, we want to support signaling so our tests can communicate with one another even though they are running across device and across apps. And most of our talk is going to focus on the signaling functionality since that's what enables us to do the cross-app and cross-device communication. And what does Octopus do? Well, Octopus streamlines the following functionalities in the command line. So whether it's run by an end user on a laptop or it's running by our Jenkins CI, it's running the exact same command. So this makes integration with Jenkins super easy. So what does it do? First, it prepares the test targets. So test targets, I, I mean, either it can be a device or it can be an Android emulator or iOS simulator. So it installs the apps on them, puts all the test configuration test data on the device, and launches the app, for example. And then it runs the test and then handles the underlying communication across the different tests using signaling. And then at the end of the test, it creates the test reports and also pulls all the necessary test artifacts like bug reports, screenshots from a device or emulators and performs any necessary cleanups. Now, let's see another demo of Octopus in action. In this demo, you'll see Octopus launching multiple iOS simulators at once and runs a test on them, wait for all of them to finish before it finally exits. Let's play. So here, you can see Octopus launches five iOS simulators. Each represent, represents a different iOS version. So it runs the login and log out for all of the simulators. And one by one, they log out and they exit. And Octopus will wait for all of them to finish before it finally exits. So using parallelized test runs, we can use it to share our tests across multiple test targets to speed up our tests. Another usage is that it's similar to the web testing world. You can, sh you can run the same tests across different iOS versions to make sure the test runs for all of them. So now I'm going to hand it over to BN, who's going to deep dive into the design of Octopus. Thank you, Apple. My name is BN. I'm from the mobile test infra team at Uber. So before joining Uber, I was working for Facebook on the performance testing framework for mobile applications. Today, let's talk about some technical details. But before that, let me share with you some of the design philosophies. So first of all, we want to make sure Octopus is easy to use. So all the demo you see today in the slides is triggered by a single Octopus command line, which is unified and simplified across different platforms. And we want to make sure Octopus works, works the same way with different platforms like Android, iOS, simulator, emulator, and real devices. And we chose to integrate with the, ex the existing testing frameworks, such as UAutomator, Espresso, or iOS UAutomation, so that the developers can use the platform-specific functionalities directly without introducing another layer. So let's talk about signaling. Before diving into the technical details, let me share with you some of the terminologies. So the test host is where Octopus runs. It could be a Mac Mini or a laptop, um, which you work on every day. And the actual test code is running on the test targets, which could be simulators, emulators, and real devices. And between test targets, we have uh, communication channels. And in the communication channels, we pass around signals. We want to make sure the Octopus is simple to understand and easy to implement. So we just use the very simple strings for signals. And it's the test targets and test codes responsibility to interpret the meaning of the signals, for example, driver online, as Apple mentioned uh, earlier. So how does it work? 
using the same example in the end-to-end -end trip app just mentioned, we have a driver test target and a rider test target. So first, the driver sends a driver online to the rider test target, and the rider test target requests for a trip and sends back another signal telling driver that I've already requested a trip, and you can go, you can proceed and uh, do the further verification UI or uh, test steps. So on top of the high-level workflow, we introduced two very simple APIs. The read signal, which will block until a signal is retrieved or is timed out. It's read the signal from a channel and it returns the string or timeout. And correspondingly, we have a write signal, which writes uh, another string to a channel, which is a long blocking call. The API works as below. Using the same example, we have a driver and a rider. So first, the rider calls read signal on a channel called rider inbox. So by looking at the name, you know the rider inbox is a channel which contains all the incoming messages for the rider. And then the driver will call the write signal on the same channel, writer inbox, with the signal called driver online. And this function call will trigger the return of the read signal on the writer side. Uh, after that, the driver waits for another signal by calling a read signal on another channel, which is driver inbox, which is the all incoming uh, messages for the, rider, for the driver. And this read signal function call will be triggered uh, by another uh, function called write signal from the writer side. So this is how the API works uh, at a very high level. So how do we implement that? At a very high level, we have the two-way communication channel between test targets. But internally, we have two one-way communication channels, like the writer inbox and driver inbox. So it's a typical P2P communication between two test targets or multiple test targets. So it's really easy to think of some P2P technologies like Bluetooth, direct internet connection, uh, NFC or AirDrop. So we have plenty of choices. But we do have a problem, which is the consistency. Because one technology might work perfectly on one uh, platform, but not on another. So if we choose different implementations or different technologies on different platforms, we will end up with multiple uh, implementations for different platforms, which will increase the complexity of our system. So we switch to a more consistent way, which is the relay via test host. Because in the test scenario, the communication channel between test host and test target is always consistent and reliable. So in the beginning, we chose uh, a client-server architecture which is very easy to think about. So the test target and test host communicates with uh, some uh, uh, network protocol. This is easy and uh, this is typical, but there's a problem in this architecture too, which is the reachability. Because your test host, your Mac mini or laptop, is usually running in a protected network, like your data center or your cofnet. But your test target might be running in the cellular network or public Wi-Fi, or even no network if you want to test the offline mode. So it's not guaranteed that the test host is always reachable by the test target. So that means we need to find something more reliable and always available. Because we're running a test scenario, so we chose a more reliable connection, which is a USB. So imagine you are doing a device testing. You always connect your device using USB cable to your test host. And it works the same way with the simulator and emulator because the testing framework provides the consistent uh, communication channel between test host and test target. So by using this, we, implement, uh, we implemented a, a virtual two-way communication between test targets. So now we have the communication protocol or we have the communication channel. What do we pass around in the communication channels? We chose the most fundamental and most reliable storage unit in the operating system, which is a file. Here's how it works. So first, the driver 
generates the file containing a string called driver online on the test target. And then this file is passed from the test target to the test host. And the test host relays the test uh, the, the, the simulator the, the, the signal string to the test target. So logically we have the same implementation of write signal. So now the question becomes, how do we pass around files? So specifically, we have two questions to answer. The first one is, how do we send a file or a string from test target to test host, which is essentially the implementation of the right signal. And correspondingly, we have another question, how do we watch or monitor a file on the test host from the test target? Because your test code is running actually on test target, which is essentially the implementation of the read signal. And this is where Octopus diverges on different platforms. So let's talk about them one by one. On iOS, the iOS Reautomation framework provides a very convenient API called UIA host perform task with path argument timeout, which is essentially the equivalent of exec. So by using exec, you can essentially run any shell commands on the test host, which is really convenient. So with, with that, the write signal and read signal become very simple to implement. So for the write signal, we just write uh, something to uh, some file on the, on the test host. And for read signal, we just use a cat to, to check the content of the file. So the actual implementation of, uh, of read signal on iOS is uh, a little bit more complicated. We have um, a shell loop, which constantly checking the, the file uh, content for the signal and then trigger the return of read signal once the file uh, content has changed. On the other side, on Android, so unfortunately there's no direct exec. Everything should be in, uh, initiated from test host. So we have to use ADB shell uh, as a relayer. So here is how it works. For the write signal, the test host starts a daemon process which monitors a signal file on the test target, on one of the test target using ADB shell. And then the driver generates the file or change the file content on the test target, which will be detected by the test host, by the daemon running on test host. And then the test host grabs the file from the driver test target and relays it to the other test target for the rider. So logically, we implemented write signal from the driver to rider. Because we're pushing a file directly to the rider test target, so the read signal becomes really simple. We just use the file observer on Android to monitor the content of the file. Once it's changed, we trigger the return of the read signal. So as you can see, the design of the signal in Octopus is really flexible and scalable. So that it's very easy to implement one-to-one uh, -one signaling, one-to-many signaling, as well as many-to-many -many signaling. And the majority of the implementation of signaling is platform agnostic. The only, uh, only thing that diverges is the actual uh, file uh, observation on different platforms. So that it's easy to implement the cross-platform signaling. Imagine you have an iOS writer talking to an Android driver. So given that, I'd like to show you another demo, which shows the most complicated test scenario in a Uber application, which is Uber Pool. So as Apple mentioned, if you have multiple riders coming to the same location, they can share the same car with the same driver, which requires one driver and multiple riders. So as you can see, we have the three simulators, a driver and two riders, and all of them sign in. The driver goes online. And after that, it sends the driver online signal to the first rider. Then the first rider pick up a, a location and uh, select the destination and request for the share ride, which is Uber Pool, which will be captured by the driver. And the driver will pick up the first rider and then send another signal to the second rider saying, I've already picked up the first rider. The second rider can start request the Uber trip now. So the second rider got the signal pick up the locations, and request for a share ride. 
And as you can see, on the driver side, the second pickup has different UI. So we, we will have different verifications of the test steps. And after the two riders are picked up, the driver will start the trip. And then drop off the first rider. And then the second rider. And after that, the driver will read the, dri uh, the riders and end the whole test scenario. So as I mentioned, the whole scenario is triggered by only one Octopus command line. It handles all the uh, device bootstrapping, uh, initialization, and the coordination, synchronization between test targets. And the, synchroni the synchronization is handled by Octopus <coughs> signaling. So that's all I have. Questions? Um, so the first two questions are pretty much duplicates, um, mm -hmm. which is, uh, why is there a need to test both the apps at the same time? Why not simulate uh, requests and responses or fake, have fake backends? Okay, I can answer that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we do have different test modes. So this one is the full end-to-end -end test mode. Uh, the reason why we need this is sometimes we need to test the different configurations on the server side. For example, we have a test city, with uh, certain functionalities enabled. And uh, we have other test city with different functionalities. Though, though we have some dynamics on the server side, we want to make sure we have a test scenario to cover uh, different uh, scenarios, both on the client side and the server side. So that's why we need end-to-end, -end, which simulates both the driver and the rider side. I mean, this is not like a replacement for like unit tests or your medium level component tests where you can mock out server responses. This is meant for a small fraction of your, you know, like your core happy path tests that give you the final confidence that your system, you know, the high level components in your system is connected correctly. So it's only a small fraction of it that gives you the final confidence. So we're using all different modes in our tests. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it would be hard to identify root causes of test failure when there are two separate units under test and there are associated tests in different process spaces. Has this proven to be a challenge in practice? Actually, for uh, you know, using this is actually makes our tests easier to de debug because each test is only waiting for one thing at a time. So when something fails, you, you, uh, there's no doubt by like, oh, did the, for example, did the rider, did the driver go online before I request? Like, if something fails, you know that okay, driver already sent a signal that's online. That means like something on the rider side failed. So uh, versus if you don't have this, you'll be like pulling for different conditions, and sometimes the conditions are not even visible on the UI. And it's really hard. So so I think having this definitely makes the test actually easier to write and easier to debug. Uh. Do you experience flakiness when sending signals between emulators? Um, so, because the, because the test, uh, test codes are running on different simulators, so the communication between them uh, is challenging. So that's why we chose the, the uh, as reliable approach as possible, like the file-based uh, signaling, the USB connection, to reduce the thickness. So, uh, so far, we, we didn't see many flakeness. It's yeah. pretty stable because we use the most reliable technology. So far, this is actually more reliable than like Appium that we look into, for example, with the client server architecture. You know, um, so far the flakiness we found is not from the signaling. It's more from like the real time server responses. Occasionally, it times out or something happens there. So, but but it's not about signaling. Okay, um, could you clarify what the system under test actually is? It sounds like you, ah, my question left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do you have it, Diego, that I can read? Uh, the, is it back there? Oh, yeah, there it is. Thanks, guys, for upvoting. <laughs> um, it sounds that like you, uh, compromise performing end-to-end -end testing with your test infrastructure in between the apps, which is not the case in production. Could you elaborate on that? 
Oh. What's that? So what are you actually trying to test with this type of test is basically the question and what you know, what were the compromises made or what other things did you have to put in place to mitigate any yeah. compromises? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, on top of having unit tests and then the test that tests, you know, like if you mock out the driver and look at, you know, the rider specifically, this allows you to test like the core flow, of the more complicated interactions between the two to make sure when you go through like the core chip flow, which is like one of our core cases, right? To make sure like each app can go through the expected sequence of state changes and then it's able to complete the trip and you know, complete the happy path and then at the end they can reach each other. So Octopus is not, not making any modifications on the application itself. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not modifying the backend as, uh, as well. So we're testing whatever we have, either it's production or it's the staging environment uh, or it's the, the uh, beta application. Well, thank you, Apple and Beyond. Thank you. Thanks.